Hey writers, in honor of the paperback of my fantasy novel finally publishing next week, I asked you guys what writer topic you'd like to see this week. And a bunch of you were really excited to learn how to use the Enneagram to develop strong relatable characters just like I did with my large cast of fairies. I think we can all agree that having strong characters in our books is essential. While our story concept might draw readers in, what they stay for are the characters. If our characters don't feel believable or relatable in a way that gets the readers invested into their journey, it's more likely that they'll just put the book down and never reach the end of the stories that we've worked so hard on. While editing my series that has one main character but four other pretty important supportive characters, a pixie pirate, a mute beast tamer, a flirtatious merman, a half-blind artist, and a pompous princess, all competing for the fairy crown. I worked really hard to go deep with these characters to make each one distinct, relatable, compelling, and for each one to have their own character arc. And the easiest tool I found to help me do this by far is the Enneagram. While I still make use of character profiles, which can be really helpful if they're set up effectively, many profile templates I've seen include so many extraneous things that don't often feel pertinent to my character or my story. And I found that these type of profiles actually distract and frustrate me more than help me nail down my character and actually get to writing. Using the Enneagram, however, has really streamlined my process to creating a great foundation for really strong characters. So in this video, I'm excited to show you what I've come to believe are the essentials for making a strong, relatable, believable, fleshed out character, or even a large cast of characters and their character arcs, and how the Enneagram pretty much gives us all the basics we need. I'll give a quick overview of the Enneagram, its nine types, and tips for how you can use it to create your characters, along with specific examples of characters from popular stories like Harry Potter, Marvel's Adventures, and the TV show Friends, plus my own characters from my serial series on Wings of Ash and Dust, which is finally coming out as one complete paperback novel in less than a week. And if you stay until the end, I'll share how you can download an easy Enneagram reference guide for character building that I've seriously been wanting to put together forever, plus my free character profile based on this process. It's been so great to see reviewers of my series comment on how real and flesh out my characters are, so I can't wait for you to use this tool to help get the same kind of reactions from your readers. First, let's talk about the main things I've come to feel are essential for any character, aka if nothing else, this is what goes in my character profiles, and how the Enneagram basically gives you everything you need to fill out each item. For the essentials, I like to use the list Jessica Brody gives in her her novel craft book, Save the Cat Writes a Novel, because she focuses less on the nitty gritty details at first, like what's their favorite snack, but instead focuses on what character elements will help us shape the transformation or growth arc the character must go through throughout the story to learn their life lesson. I've come to believe that a compelling character arc is what really takes hold of a reader and doesn't let them go until the end because that's what each of us are ultimately going through in our own lives too. We can find almost any character super relatable as we watch them desire something deeply, struggle tooth and nail to get it, finally figure out what they've been missing all this time, and eventually grow from a place of weakness to strength broken to healing, beaten down to victorious, believing lies to believing the truth, and changing from wanting a superficial desire to a deep-seated need. To do this, Save the Cat outlines the following things to figure this out. One, who basically is your hero? Maybe the initial inspiration you had for them, their gender, age, personality, physical appearance, strengths, and skills. Then Jessica says to focus on their weaknesses, which leads to their main problems or flaws. Also their backstory, where their wounding, shard of glass, lie, misbelief, whatever you wanna call it, that's causing their problems and flaws came from and how that brought about their deepest fears. This then leads to an external goal they have, or if you wanna call that a desire, a want, a motivation, but ultimately leads to an internal need, the truth or life lesson they need to learn in order to experience transformation which could also be translated as your book's theme. And of course, we have to think about those pesky obstacles, internal and external, that they'll have to overcome along the way. So how do you effectively come up with all these things? This is where the Enneagram is a lifesaver. So what's the Enneagram? 
According to research I've done, the Enneagram is a typology system that describes human personality as nine distinct yet interconnected personality types. Each of these can help you develop more of who your hero is, and we'll do a quick overview of each type in just a bit. Within that personality, each type usually has certain strengths that come out when they're in a healthy or safe place in their life, and also weaknesses that come out when they're unhealthy or in stress. These strengths and weaknesses are usually rooted in the person's childhood or backstory in some way which leads to a core wounding, shard of glass, lie, misbelief, and fears. Are we seeing where this is connecting a little bit to what we just talked about? These woundings give this type a core motivation or want or desire, which can lead to a certain kind of external goal. But ultimately, the Enneagram's goal is not to label people or put them in a box with their personality type, but instead, the Enneagram is all about transformation. It's designed to help someone become the healthiest version of themselves by identifying what a certain type's biggest internal need is, the obstacles that might get in the way of them getting to their need, and how ultimately to get them there, just like a character arc. Isn't it cool to see how everything the Enneagram gives us actually ends up fulfilling all the essentials to any character arc that we listed before? So what are these Enneagram types and how can you use them for your characters? First, here's a diagram that shows the nine basic types, what they're sometimes called, and how they are interconnected. But as I go into each more in depth, let me first make this clear that the descriptions I'm about to give you are not my own, but are a collection of things I found helpful from a bunch of different Enneagram resources, like the book on the screen, The Road Back to You, which I love and highly suggest reading, and the Enneagram Institute website, which I'll share links to that and a bunch of others down below. If you're anything like me, you might want to take a few notes on each type as I talk about them, but I'll also share at the end how you can download that easy Enneagram reference sheet, so feel free to sit back and just take it all in as well. I'll also list some characters that fit these types from other stories, and it might be fun to try to identify which type fits your characters or even which one you might be yourself. Let's start at the beginning with type one, commonly called the perfectionist, but I've also heard it referred to as the reformer, which I kind of prefer. Overall, ones are conscientious and ethical with a strong sense of right and wrong. They are teachers, crusaders, and advocates for change, always striving to improve things, but afraid of making a mistake. Well-organized, orderly, and fastidious, they try to maintain high standards but can slip into being critical and perfectionistic. Digging a little deeper, some of their strengths are being responsible and idealistic, while some of their weaknesses are sometimes being judgmental and hyper-perfectionistic. Then if we look at more of their transformation journey and arc, where they will begin is often with a fear or lie, which for type one is usually corruption. They fear becoming bad, evil, or defective saying to themselves, I'll only have peace on the inside when everything is perfect on the outside. Their key desire or want is perfection, to be good, to have integrity, to be balanced. And their key motivation or goal is to be right, to strive higher and improve everything, to be consistent with their ideals, to justify themselves, to be beyond criticism so as not to be condemned by anyone. When they're in a place of stress, their flaws come out and like an unhealthy four, this is being moody and irrational. But as they grow, the healing message or inner need or truth they need to learn is you don't need to be perfect to be good. You are loved in all your imperfection. Tranquility only comes when you surrender your compulsive need for perfection and stop stifling your emotions. In a healthy place, ones become more like a healthy seven, more spontaneous and joyful. And at their best, they are wise, discerning, realistic, and noble, and can often be morally heroic. Some examples I have on the left here are Harry Potter, Captain America from the Avengers, and Monica from the TV show Friends. But what about type two? The helper. Twos are empathetic, sincere, and warm-hearted. They are friendly, generous, and self-sacrificing, but can also be sentimental, flattering, and people-pleasing. They are well-meaning and driven to be close to others, but can slip into doing things for others in order to be needed. They typically have problems with possessiveness and with acknowledging their own needs. Their strengths are being kind and generous, while their weaknesses are sometimes being intrusive and needy. On their journey to transformation, they might start out believing the lie of unworthiness. They fear being unloved or unwanted wanted for just being themselves and having needs. They might say to themselves, I am unlovable. The only way to be loved is through hiding my vulnerabilities. Their key desire is to be loved and valued. Their goal is to be loved, to express their feelings for others, to be needed and appreciated. In stress, they're like unhealthy eights, aggressive and dominating. But once they embrace their inner need or truth, they start believing that it's healthy to have needs. 
that they are loved and wanted just as they are. In a place of growth, they are like healthy for, self-nurturing, and emotionally aware. And at their best, they are unselfish, altruistic, and have unconditional love for others. Examples of a two might be Dobby from Harry Potter, Spider-Man from The Avengers, Gunther from Friends. And then I've also included my character, Aaron, from On Wings of Ash and Dust. If you want to hear how I figured out how Aaron is an Enneagram 2, how figuring that out helped me develop his character more, plus the same kind of behind the scenes details for each of my characters, you can check out this video I did last year starting at the 26 minute mark where I go super in depth and we had a lot of fun talking about these characters. I really struggled with Aaron in the beginning, particularly because I wasn't fleshing him out enough on the page for everybody to really love him, especially my developmental e editor who actually wanted uh, Quinn to be romantic interest with somebody else. And um, so we talked through this and I thought that Aaron was a seven, which is the optimist or enthusiast. But then I was talking with my editor and she and was telling her like all the things that like I really feel he is. And she's like, I don't think he's a seven. I think you're playing him as a seven. But I think what you really think about him is that he is a two the helper which see yes which is holly that's what i was thinking i was like you know what i think he's a two yes for now let's go to type three the achiever threes are self-assured attractive and charming ambitious competent and energetic they can also be status conscious and highly driven for advancement they typically have problems with workaholism and competitiveness their strengths are being productive and adaptable while their weaknesses are being overly image conscious and sometimes out of touch with their emotions at the beginning of a story, their main fear might be worthlessness, being without value apart from their achievements, basically believing I am what I do. Their key desire is being valued to feel worthwhile. Their goal is to be affirmed, to distinguish themselves from others, to have attention, to be admired, and to impress others. In stress, they are like unhealthy nines, disengaged and apathetic, but the truth they need to embrace is it's okay to just be. You are loved for who you are, not what you accomplish. When healthy and embracing this truth, they're like healthy sixes, more cooperative and committed to others. And at their best, they are self-accepting, authentic role models who inspire others. Type threes can be like Hermione Granger, Iron Man, Rachel from Friends, and my character, Vale from On Wings of Ash and Dust. For type fours or individualists, they are self-aware, sensitive, and reserved. They are emotionally honest, creative, and personal, but can also be moody and self-conscious. Withholding themselves from others due to feeling vulnerable and defective, they can also feel disdainful and exempt from ordinary ways of living. They typically have problems with melancholy, self-indulgence, and self-pity. Their strengths are being creative and idealistic, while their weaknesses are being self-absorbed and unrealistic. Their key fear or lie is commonness. They fear having no identity or no personal significance, saying, no one understands me. There must be something wrong with me. Their key desire or want is authenticity, to find themselves and their significance with an identity that is unique and special. Their goal or motivation is to express themselves with their individuality, to create and surround themselves with beauty, sometimes to withdraw to protect their self-image, to take care of emotional needs before attending to anything else. In stress, they are like unhealthy twos, over-involved and clinging, but the truth they need to hear is you are whole and complete just as you are now. Nothing within you is missing. You are seen and beautiful, so don't be ashamed. As they heal and grow, they are like healthy ones, objective and principled, and at their best, they are inspired and highly creative. They are able to renew themselves and transform their experiences. Great examples of type fours are Luna Lovegood from Harry Potter, Loki from The Avengers, Mike from Friends, and my character, Hickory, from On Wings of Ash and Dust. Type five, or the investigators, are very interesting as well. And I can say this because I am one. Fives are alert, insightful, and curious. They are able to concentrate and focus on developing complex ideas and skills. Independent, innovative, and inventive, they can also become preoccupied with their thoughts and imaginary constructs. They become detached, yet high-strung and intense. They typically have problems with eccentricity and isolation. Their key strengths are being perceptive and self-reliant, but their weaknesses are being emotionally detached and cynical. Their key lie is that they believe they are useless. They fear being helpless or incapable, believing I am not competent to handle the demands of life. Their key desire is competency to be capable and secure. Their goal is to possess knowledge, to understand their environment, to have everything figured out as a way of defending the self from external threats. In stress, they are like unhealthy sevens, hyperactive and scattered. But the truth they need to embrace is you are competent and have all the wisdom you need. Embrace abundance, not scarcity. Don't be afraid to be generous with your time, knowledge and affection. 
and let others in so that they can be generous with you too. In a healthy place, they're like healthy eights, self-confident and decisive, and at their best, they are visionary pioneers, often ahead of their time and able to see the world in an entirely new way. Great examples of fives are Snape from Harry Potter, Doctor Strange from The Avengers, and Ross from Friends. How about type six, the loyalist? Sixes are reliable, hardworking, responsible, and trustworthy, excellent troubleshooters. They foresee problems and foster cooperation, but can also become defensive, evasive, and anxious, running on stress while complaining about it. Their strengths are that they are loyal and engaging while their weaknesses are being reactive and fearful. Their key fear is isolation, having no support or guidance, being unable to survive on their own, believing that the world is not safe. Their key desire is to want safety, to have security and support, and their goal is to get that security to feel supported by others and to fight against anxiety and insecurity. In stress, they are like unhealthy threes, competitive and arrogant, and the truth they need to embrace is you can trust yourself to courageously handle whatever happens. You are more resourceful than you know, so hold on to faith. As they grow, they are like healthy nines, relaxed and optimistic, and at their best, they are internally stable and self-reliant, courageously championing themselves and others. Great examples of sixes are Neville and also Ron, I think, from Harry Potter, Black Panther from The Avengers, and Chandler from Friends. Three more types to go. We have type seven, the enthusiast. Sevens are extroverted optimistic, versatile, and spontaneous, playful, high-spirited, and practical, they can also misapply their many talents, becoming overextended, scattered, and undisciplined. They constantly seek new and exciting experiences, but can become distracted and exhausted by staying on the go. Their key strengths are being optimistic and fun, while their weaknesses are being impulsive and under-disciplined. A seven's basic fear is having a boring or painful existence, being deprived or trapped in pain, believing I must run from negative feelings and change the next exciting moment to be happy. Their key desire is many experiences, to be satisfied and content, to have their needs fulfilled. Their main motivation or goal is to maintain their freedom and happiness, to avoid missing out on worthwhile experiences, to keep themselves excited and occupied, to avoid and discharge pain. In stress, they are like unhealthy ones, perfectionistic and critical. But in a healing place, they can embrace their truth. Everything you could ever need, you already have. Embrace and steward your suffering rather than running from it. Rest and be. As they grow, they become like healthy fives, focused and fascinated by life. And at their best, they focus their talents on worthwhile goals, becoming appreciative, joyous, and satisfied. Great examples of sevens are Fred and George from Harry Potter, Star-Lord or Quill from The Avengers, and Joey from Friends. Type eights are our challengers. Eights are self-confident, strong, and assertive, protective, resourceful, and straight-talking and divisive, but can also be egocentric and domineering. They feel like they must control their environment, especially people, sometimes becoming confrontational and intimidating. They typically have problems with their tempers and with allowing themselves to be vulnerable. Their key strengths are being bold and decisive, while their weaknesses are being domineering and combative. An eight's key lie is loss of control, being harmed or controlled by others. They believe only the strong survive. Their key desire is autonomy to protect the self, to be in control of their life and destiny. Their key motivation or goal is to be self-reliant, to prove their strength and resist weakness, to be important in their world, to dominate the environment, and to stay in control of their situation. In stress, they are like unhealthy fives, withdrawn, less connected to emotions, secretive and fearful, hypervigilant about betrayal, and even more uncompromising. The truth they need to embrace is vulnerability is a strength. Betrayal is a real risk, but there are trustworthy people in the world, and love and connection will forever elude you unless you lower your defenses. Life may hurt, but you're strong enough to survive it. As they grow, eights are like healthy twos, more caring, they don't hide their tender side, and they listen and trust more, allowing others to take care of them. At their best, they use their strength to improve others' lives, becoming heroic, magnanimous, and inspiring. Characters who fit the eight type are Mad-Eye Moody from Harry Potter, Black Widow from The Avengers, Janice from Friends, and my own main character, Quinn from On Wings of Ash and Dust. Finally, we have type nine, the peacemaker, which is also the type my husband is. Nines are accepting, trusting, and stable. They're usually creative, optimistic, and supportive, but can also be too willing to go along with others to keep the peace. They want everything to go smoothly and be without conflict, 
but they can also tend to be complacent, simplifying problems and minimizing anything upsetting. They typically have problems with inertia and stubbornness. Their main strengths are being calm and reliable, while their weaknesses are being passive, aggressive, and unmotivated. Nines fear loss most of all, particularly losing or being separated from loved ones, fearing rejection just for being who they are. So typically they think to themselves, what I think, feel, or want doesn't ultimately matter. They mostly desire stability, to have inner peace of mind and avoid conflict. Their goal is to create harmony in their environment, to avoid conflicts and tension, to preserve things as they are, to resist whatever would upset or disturb them. In stress, they are like unhealthy sixes, more anxious and worried, but the truth they need to embrace is you are seen and important just as you are. Your life and what you think matters. The absence of conflict is not the presence of peace. Peace requires work and risk. Wake up and say yes to the adventure of your own life. As they grow, they become like healthy threes, more self-developing and energetic, and at their best, they are indomitable and all-embracing. They are able to bring people together and heal conflicts. Examples of peacemaking nines are Hagrid, from Harry Potter, Bruce Banner, aka the Hulk from Avengers, Phoebe from Friends, and my own character, Alice from On Wings of Ash and Dust. Isn't it so cool how much information the Enneagram can give you for each kind of character you create? Plus, these types really help make your characters more relatable and real because these are actual personality types that have been studied and tested. This way, readers will easily be able to identify either themselves or another person in their life in your characters. Doing this work on your character can also be so helpful when writing or editing a scene and trying to determine how a particular character would believably react what they would say, how they would feel, which helps keep your character consistent, believable, and unique. I wouldn't say you need to create a character that matches an Enneagram type exactly, but it is helpful to pick one that is closest so you have a good starting point. Now that you have a good handle on the Enneagram types, here's some ways I suggest to start using the Enneagram to develop your characters. First, if you've already started working on a character, I would start with the basic idea you already have. Then read through all the Enneagram types to see which one most closely matches your current character and use all the other details listed in that type to flesh out your character even more. If you've already written your first draft or two, you can also use this process in the editing stage to develop your characters further, which is what I did with this series. Let's go a bit deeper though. If we were starting with one character, the easiest place to start is to identify four keys to any character transformation arc. Their goal, their desire, want, or motivation. Their lie, their misbelief caused by a wound, their backstory, what has shaped their lies, wounding, desires, basically where they originated from, and their truth, the life lesson or theme they need to learn in order to transform. If you already know one of these four key elements, I'd start with that one and then use that to figure out the others. For example, if you know what the lie is that they're believing, use the Enneagram to find out which type has the lie you already have in your character, and that Enneagram type will tell you the truth they need to learn, their key goals or desires, and even a possible backstory Story that will help you fill out the rest. Again, you can check out my reference guide to find all of these details. You can also find their key weaknesses or flaws and their strengths, how they react in health or stressful situations, and your characters are bound to go through both stages throughout your story. Plus, there's one more level to the Enneagram called Wings. Wings help us see that there are actually variations within each type. While you might be a certain Enneagram number, you also might lean towards characteristics of another number, which will be one of the two Enneagram numbers on either side of you in the Enneagram chart. For example, my character Quinn is an Enneagram 8, which means she can be an 8 wing 7 or an 8 with a 7 wing, or she could be an 8 wing 9, which is an 8 with a wing of 9. After studying both of these subtypes, it was quite obvious that she was an 8 wing 7, which is also called the Maverick. They are more extroverted, enterprising, energetic, quick, materialistic, interested in power, and can be egocentric. So if only having nine types to choose from feels limiting for your characters, the wings actually extend the nine types to 18 subtypes, which all have their own mini description that I've included in the reference guide I'll give you at the end. What if you're looking to add more characters or side characters to your story or give distinct personalities to a character that feels flat or empty? Maybe it's a friend of your main character, an acquaintance, a parent, a romantic interest, an antagonist. A great place to start is asking which Enneagram types are missing in your story. Read through those types and see which characters might be a good support 
foil, or villain for your current characters, and then build a character around that type. This helps ensure that you don't just have a book of all the same kinds of characters, but your world feels fleshed out with a bunch of different kinds of people. Similarly, if you have a large main cast like I do, it's helpful to make sure that all of your characters have different types. This helps create a well-rounded cast and can even help define relationships between them. There are actually whole articles and books that describe how different Enneagram types relate to other Enneagram types as friends, romantic relationships, work relationships, etc. I know that was a lot of information to swallow, but I hope you can see how helpful doing a little studying of the Enneagram can be for creating your characters. If you want even more, don't forget to sign up for my newsletter, link down below, where you can download my Enneagram reference guide and my story templates, including my character profiles, largely based on this Enneagram process. Plus, you'll get links to other helpful Enneagram resources. And if you want to see my characters and their Enneagram types in action, you'll get links to my ebooks. Plus, you'll get alerted when the paperback comes out next week so you can see in action how I use the Enneagram throughout my story with a bunch of different character types. I'm so excited to celebrate the book's release next week with you guys. I've got a bunch of really fun things planned, but until then, check out one of these two videos for even more, and we'll see you there. Hey!